My name is David Douglas. I want to welcome you to uh, our YouTube channel, which we are calling it the Douglas Family History YouTube channel. In our last video, we had talked about the Douglas family in Scotland. And we had talked about the first man that we ended the video talking about the first man uh, that took on the Douglas name as far as we've seen as far as in written history. And he took on that Douglas name, and he was known as William the Douglas. And majority of the researchers has determined that a man named Theobald Le Fleming was his father. And there, there's been a lot of things, you know, to determine this. And, and one thing was that William the Douglas inherited uh, the land of Theobald Le Fleming, possibly, you know, in a will. And, and in an inheritance. So I believe that this proves that Theobald Le Fleming is the father of William D. Douglas. So I know that there probably will be some, you know, to uh, disagree with me on this, but today I want to talk about the Douglas and Le Fleming family connection. And people may disagree, but I believe that these families are actually one family, as far as even one bloodline. Like I said, it goes back to William de Douglas there in Scotland. And like I said, a lot of researchers have proved that his father was Theobald Le Fleming. And the name Le Fleming means, you know, that this family came from Flanders. And they also spoke the Flemish language. Flanders, as most people may know, is in the northern part uh, of Belgium. And also that there is a little area in the north corner, the north top right-hand corner of France. At one time, and I don't know, and even possibly now, could be called the county of Flanders. So Theobald Le Fleming was born 1120 in Alderman Manor, uh, Lanarkshire, England, and his father was Sir Michael Le Fleming. And Theobald would marry Kersdale de Moravia. And they would have the son, William de Douglas, who was born 1146 in Lanarkshire, Scotland. And he received a land patent not too far from the modern-day village of Douglas, Scotland, in Lanarkshire, Scotland. Like I said, this is the same land that William de Douglas would inherit. Theobald Le Fleming would die 1193 in Douglasdale, Lanarkshire, Scotland. And his father, which I said was Sir William Le Fleming, who was my 28th great-grandfather, Sir Michael was born in 1095 in Beckernet, Cumberland, England. And all this is in the northern part of England. And his father was William Le Fleming. And his mother was Lady Ada Rummagee. And Michael the Fleming and his wife, whose name is unknown, their children was Theobald the Fleming, who was born 1120, died 1193. Sir Michael the Fleming would die 1154 in Alderman Manor, Lancashire, England. Now, and I know these families might have had other children, but these are the ones that I, I've just found. William Le Fleming, who was my 29th great-grandfather, who was Michael Le Fleming's father, he was born in 1074 in Devonshire, England. And his father was Urchinball Le Fleming. So this William Le Fleming, he would marry Lady Ada Rummagee, and they had Sir Michael Le Fleming, who was born 1095 in Beckernet, Cumberland, England. 
This William LeFleming, he would die in 1154 in the Alderman Manor, Lancashire, England. Archambault LeFleming, and he was the first one to take on this name, LeFleming. I believe, according to my research, he was born approximately 1024 in Rouen, or Rouen, however you want to pronounce it, Normandy, France. Like I said, he took the name Le Fleming because, you know, uh, the way probably, you know, he, he spoke, they, they might have even, you know, began to call him that, like Fleming, so he took on that name because of his, the way he talked as far as that Flemish speaking. His father was Urchinbald, the Viscount of Rouen, Normandy, France. Viscount actually means something like a sheriff. So Urchinbald and his wife, talking about Urchinbald the Fleming, the one that came into England, they had these children, Stephen the Fleming, born 1070, and John the Fleming, born 1072, and then William Le Fleming, who is one of my ancestors, born 1074. So before coming to England, Archambault Le Fleming, he was born in Rouen, Normandy, France. And his father, like I said, was Archambault, the Viscount of Rouen, Normandy, France. This is a title, the title Viscount, is, is, is the title uh, given... And it's a title of nobility, like I said, which means something like a sheriff. His father, Archambald the Fleming's father, Archambald Viscount of Rouen, is said to be a high-ranking officer in the ducal court of Normandy. He was an officer of the court of the Duke of Normandy, which was actually William the Conqueror. Some have said that Archambault Le Fleming, the first one to come into England, as far as to take on that name Le Fleming, is really said to have come to England uh, with William the Conqueror, you know, in, in that Battle of Hastings. But I, and, and a lot of people said there's, there's really hardly, you know, not much proof that he came at that time, but he came later. But there is a record that appears in a charter there in Normandy, France. This is like a medieval charter document that says this urchin ball. He was sitting out overseas and the date was 1067. And I believe that this is the year that William the Conqueror made a return trip back to England around December of 1067, and, and then his wife would come a little bit later, so it, it probably ran on over even into uh, the year 1068. So, but yet, you know, looking at this Archambault Le Fleming, it, it, it does not look like that he was married before he left Normandy. I, I do not have no record. So I believe after arriving in England, he became a landowner, and his name does appear in the Doomsday Book, dated 1086. Now, this book was about a lot of the people that came with William the Conqueror and, and helped him and, and, and some of their families, and they, they would receive land in England, and they called this the Doomsday Book. So Archambault the Fleming began to own land in Devonshire and Cornwall, England. Like I said, he probably married after arriving to England sometimes around, around 1067, 1068, maybe 1069, somewhere he got married. And, and then Archambault Le Fleming would die about 1100 in Devonshire, England. After his arrival into England, his descendants took on the name Le Fleming, I said, which means, like I said, the uh, that, you know, that they came from Flanders or they were Flemish-speaking people. Some early researcher has placed this Le Fleming family related to the earls or even what we would call the counts 
uh, of Flanders that even goes back to Baldwin, the first earl or the first count of Flanders. And I will talk about this later on in this video. And also that my research has placed the Fleming family uh, with the earls, some may even call the Counts of Flanders. I've also figured out even in my research that I have placed this family connected and even related uh, to the Counts of Flanders. And it goes back to Baldwin, who was the first Earl of Flanders. Other family research has said even about this family, the Le Fleming family, comes from the area of St. Omer's, France. That's right into the area that we're going to talk about a little bit later where I believe that Archambault Le Fleming, his father, Archambault, who was the Viscount of Rouen, came from in that area that we would actually talk about a little bit later called the, the area of Gwens, France. So even though right now we're going to go on with this family story, the Le Fleming name seems to be dropped, but the bloodline keeps going. The next one, like I said, that we talked about earlier, we're going to concentrate on now, is about Archambault, the Viscount of Rouen, Normandy, France. He was born about 990 in Gwens, Nord, Passe de Calais, France. And I believe that his parents and even some other researchers agree, some disagrees, that his parents was were Raoul de Guin, the Gwens, the third count of Gwens, this is Gwens, France, and his mother was Rosella de St. Paul. As you would see the name Urchimbal, and it is pronounced several ways, Urchimbal, Urchimbal, and you would even see it with a H, Herchimbal, and I'm going to go on with it a little bit further, even Herchimbaldi, and that's with an I at the end of it, Herchimbaldus, and a lot of that sometimes even comes out if they're single or if they married and they got children. It's just the way that they, they did things, you know, during uh, the, the medieval ages. So as you would see this name Urchinball, there is a lot of Douglas descendants with the name Archibald. I believe it's the same name but just a different spelling and maybe even way they even pronounced it. So through a lot of my research, looking back on charters dating back to the medieval days of France, I have come up with this conclusion that this urchin ball is related to the family that settled in Gwens, France. And to even show even how I come to this conclusion, I want to talk about who I believe is the sister of Urchimbal, the Viscount of Rouen, France, who I believe that this lady and this this female is Heloise de Gwens. There was a man named Gilbert Crispin, and he he wrote about as far as this family, and he even said that her Lewin, who was the son of Ansgot de Beck and Heloise Heloise de Gwens. He said that her Lewin's father, Ansgot de Beck, descended from Danish Vikings. Some way it even goes back into the Viking that actually uh, settled in the region and they formed that, 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 that region and that, that providence of Normandy. And his name was Rollo. And I know you hear a lot about that as far as in, in the Viking uh, history. So... This Ansgot de Beck and, and Helloways de Gwen. Ansgot, they said, like I said, descended from the Danish Vikings that settled Normandy. Said that her Lewin's mother, Heloise, was related to the, get this, the Counts of Flanders. But many have confused Heloise de Gwen's with one called Hawise de Gwen's, who was the daughter of of Siegfried de, Gren, de Gwens, who was the first count of Gwens. And I know it may not have been legally given this name, but a lot of people have placed this title upon him uh, to kind of, you know, uh, keep it in perspective, you know, who 
uh, this man is. But I do not believe that Siegfried de Gwens is Heloise de Gwens' uh, father. If it would be her son, and, and he had even founded as far as this, this abbey, uh, this kind of this monastery, Herloin was her son. There's a plaque and there's a story about how he, he was a knight and then he became as far as a monk and how he built this monastery. So if, if Heloise de Gwens would have been the daughter of Siegfried, I mean, there's so many years she could not have had as far as Herloin. But I believe that Heloise de Gwens did descend from Siegfried de Gwens. But I believe uh, that her father was actually Raoul, like I said earlier, the third count of Gwens. And so was also Urchimbal, this count of Ruin. Raoul, the third count of Gwens, was Urchimbal, this count of Ruin. I believe that was his father. So let's look at the connection of uh, of these two, as far as even Heloise and Urchimbal. We want to talk about some of the charters a little bit that you see as far as their, their families and their lands that they own. The first charter that I want to talk about is dated in 1043 at the Abbey St. Catherine's of the Holy Trinity on the Mount. It states that money was going to be given for the lands of Osborne, Osborne, son of Mangot. Now, this name Mangot, I believe, uh, is actually Ansgot. You know, I, I don't have the original charter. Uh, I've even tried to contact as far as the ones that's supposed to hold these charters, but they never have got back with me because I know sometimes in them old medieval documents, the A, just the way that they, 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 they wrote it, it looks like an M. So I kind of see the name and, and got there. Uh, so, but you know, we cannot find right now the original manuscript, you know, just the transcribed uh, version of it. But it lists witnesses on this uh, document that states about uh, Osborne, son of Mangot, which I believe is Ansgot. It lists a witness there named Herchimbaldi. See, like I said, that these names... It's, it's the same man, I believe it's Urchimbal. And then it says, Urchimbaldi, Advuncular Osborne. Advuncular means uncle. It's, it's Latin for uncle. So Osborne, son of Man, Mangot, which I believe is Ainsgot, is also called Osborne, the Viscount of You. Heloise's husband, Ansgot de Bet, the Beck's father was a man named Ansfredis. And on another charter dated about 1040, somewhere between 1040 and 1050, that's the dates that they give, says that Ansfredis, son of Osborne, the Viscount of You, and later a monk at Jerusalem. I mean, that, that's where he died, at, at Jerusalem, this Osborne, who I believe is also the son of Heloise de Gwyn and Ansgot de Bay. He named his son Ansfredus, which actually goes back in his family line as actually Ansgot de Beck's father. So I believe this name was given, and I believe Osborne, the Viscount of You, is actually the son of Heloise uh, de Gwens and Ansbeck, and I believe, like I said, that Urchimbald was his uncle and 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 puts Heloise and Urchimbal as brothers and brother and sister. The other charter that I want to talk about talks about Ansfredus and Osborne on land in Quarryville, and this is in France. And I believe that this shows that Urchimbal is Heloise de Gwen's brother. And Osborne, uh, uh, Viscount of you, that, that makes Urchimbal his uncle. There are several charters, and when you look this up, there are several charters that states that the lands of the children of Ansgot and Heloise are located right by the lands of Urchimbald, Viscount of Ruin, and also even his children showing 
how close that these families are. And I believe it shows that they are related. Urchambal, Viscount of Ruin, he would marry the daughter of Richard de Before. And her name is unknown. Urchambal, the Viscount, his wife's name is unknown. They would have Gilbert, and then Urchambal, who we would call the Fleming, who was born 1024, and a son named Croce, or Crokey, C-R-O-C-I, which was a son. And I believe that name has something to do with the cross. Urchambal, Viscount of Ruin, did come from nobility, I believe. And this is one reason that I believe that he and his family was closely connected and even uh, worked in the courts of the Dukes of Normandy. And I believe this is the reason. I mean, it puts them in that, that nobility line. I mean, they just don't get any in, anybody as far as the, the work, as far as under the Dukes and the Counts uh, of, of, of these, you know, in these positions. You have to be some way blood related to these families. Somewhere it said between 1030 and 1035, Urchambal, Viscount of Ruin, he gave to the Abbey of the Holy Trinity on the Mount, which was what they call St. Catherine's, and they were, what I would even say, members of this uh, monastery or members of, of this cathedral. He gave this church, the Meta of Sahur, what they call the hereditary property in Sellowville. On one charter in 1040, it mentions that William the Bastard, and that's just the way that these charters listed these names, and he was none other than William the Conqueror. But so many times it was listed. I wouldn't use as far as this name any other way except in writing. I know biblically it's mentioned as far as like, you know, in the King James Bible, it just talks about them being an illegitimate child. Said, witness that Gilbertus, or otherwise Gilbert, who was the son of the Viscount Urchambaldus, he was seriously, Gilbert was seriously injured during an assassination attempt actually on William the Conqueror when he was just the child, I mean, in that bedchamber. You might have heard the story about how many times that even as a child that there was assassination attempts on William the Conqueror. And, 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 and Osborne, I believe who was some way even related, you know, to, to this Gilbert and Urchambal, Viscount and Urchambal, uh, he was killed there that night, but yet Gilbert was also seriously wounded during that account. You see, like I said, William the Conqueror, I mean, he, he was uh, uh, he, he was up there as far as in that position, as far as as, as the ruler of, of Normandy, you know, even later become as far as even king over England. So they, they, they were like bodyguards and they ended up one being killed and the other, Archambault's son, uh, Gilbert, was seriously injured. And this charter lists the two other sons of Urchambald, Viscount of Ruin, and it lists the name Croce and Urchambald. That was the brothers of Gilbert. So before Urchambald, Viscount of Ruin, before his death, somewhere between 1030 and 1035, Urchambald, the Viscount of Ruin, entered the Trinity on the Mount Monastery in Ruin. I mean, they, they become now, I reckon, something like a monk. And his brother, Franco, witnessed this charter. He probably went into the monastery for retirement or either some health reasons. And Archambald Viscount of Ruin died about 1043 in Ruin, France. And he would even, like I said, as I said earlier, he would give up that land. And I believe that they, they were doing this sometime. They, they, they know that it wasn't going to be long before they died. So they just wanted to do something as far as, you know, for the church of that day. Uh, I, I reckon that's just the way that they see things. But, you know, the way I see it, you know, we can't buy our way, you know, as far as in, into heaven. But I know people saw things, you know, different back then. They were even encouraged as far as even by the, the, the religious world of that day to do things like that. So he died about 1043, Urchambal, Viscount of Ruin, 
and ruined France. And like I said, now his father, who I believe was Raoul de Guins, he was the third count of Guins. And like I said, this put, as far as uh, Archambault, the Viscount, that put him in that, 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 that nobility line. Even though, you know, he didn't uh, hold the title of count, he held the title kind of just below that of Viscount. So Raoul, his father, the third count of Guins, was my 32nd great-grandfather. He was the son of Ardolf de Guins, the second count of Guins, and his mother was Matilda of Boulogne. And he would marry, Raoul would marry Rosella de St. Paul, daughter of the third count of St. Paul. They had these children, Heloise de Guin, who was born 977. Like I said, she could not have been Siegfried, uh, some called him uh, the, the Dane, like a Viking, but I'm going to kind of explain that even later on. But she, she she could not have been because that would have put, I mean, her being, you know, so old to have that, that son that built that monastery. But I believe her father was actually Raoul. She was in that family line. And she was that part of the Counts of Flanders, uh, of, of, of that, you know, the Counts of Gwyn. Then they had a son named Eustachy, who was the fourth count of Gwyn's. He was the first son, and so he fell in line of being the fourth count of Gwyn's. And he was born about 980. Then they had Robert de Blunt, born 984. Sir William de Blunt, born 987. And then, like I said, they had the son called Urchinbald Viscount of Ruin, born 990. And then they had Franco, or Franconus, Born 992. Raoul de Guins, the third count of Guins, is said to have died about 1036 in Paris, France. Way away from, as far as, you know, that area. I don't know how many miles, but it wasn't in ruin and it wasn't as far as in the area of Guins, but he died in Paris, France. And his father, who was my 33rd great-grandfather, Ardolf de Guins, the second count of Guins, was born circa around 930 in Guins, Nord, past day Calais, France. His father, now we're getting into Siegfried, was Siegfried de Guins, the first count of Guins, and his mother was Etherud, daughter of Arnuth, who was the third, Arnuth number one, who was actually the third count of Flanders. Like I said earlier, there was a lot of researchers that actually put the Le Fleming family related to the Counts of Flanders, and this is where it comes in. This is actually, this is the way my paper trail has taken me, and I've tried to take these steps, and it's been a lot of hard research, and for 40 years, you know, I've come to this conclusion, and I'm still finding things, and I know, you know, you know we're human, we make mistakes, there's errors, and when I see where there is an error, I will try always to try to correct uh, that error. So he would marry, as far as Siegfried would, he would marry Etheru, daughter of Arnuth, one who was the third count of Flanders. Remember what I said about how uh, Gilbert Crisp Crispin wrote about Heloise de Gwens being related to the Counts of Flanders. And I know I'm repeating myself, but I want you to kind of, you know, get the story here. Arduth would marry Matilda of Boulogne, and their children were Raoul de Gwens, the third Count of Gwens, and Roger de Gwens, born 959. Arduth, Ardolf de Gwens would die about 996 in Gwens, France. Now we want to talk about Siegfried. And I mean, this is the character here. You know, that always seem like colorful characters, you know, in, in your family that kind of stands out, this Siegfried. I mean, he really stands out, and this starts really getting what I would call, you know, good. I don't know if a lot of people's in into all of this, but, you know, it just kind of, you know, um, kind of excites me, so to speak, you know, and uh, to see, you know, where my family and how, you know, and, and where we uh, came from as far as from what line. And I know there's a, 
you know, there, there's good and bad as far as, you know, in all family, you got to take the good, you know, with the bad, the positive and the negative, you know, makes that connection. So Siegfried de Gwens, who was the father of uh, R. R. Ardolf, who is my 34th great grandfather, was born, what I believe, about 905 in Ringelheim, Germany. You would even call this Lower Saxony. And his father was Theodric of Ringelheim, and his mother was Reginhild of Friesland. And that's in the, 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 I reckon the modern day country of, of Netherlands, uh, uh, where, where the Dutch people come from, Friesland. He was also known as Siegfried the Dane. And the only reason because his mother was of a Danish descent, Viking descent. Yeah, now we're getting in to the Vikings, which is real interesting. Siegfried was a powerful count and even military leader. There is a record that states, and I've seen this record, states that Emperor Henry I, called Henry the Fowler, gave Brandenburg and, his, and its government to Siegfried, Count of Ringelheim. Siegfried is said, and I've seen other researchers, and I've come up with my conclusion, and I agree with them on this. And I know there's one specifically, and I know I don't have, you know, any uh, rights as far, you know, to call his name, but, uh, but I do believe, and I go along with what he said, that Siegfried held both titles of the Count of Ringelheim and the Count of Gwens. According to history, Siegfried the Dane, and that's just kind of a nickname, came from came with his Vikings and seized the area of Gwens, France in 928. And it was said that he came to claim the hereditary claims. This family ruled and were actually even dukes. D-U-K-E-S had the title of dukes in Ringelheim, Germany. And like I said, this is the old term, or the old term is actually Lower Saxony. There is a book also written by Lambert of Artists called The History of the Count of Gwen. This goes back, I don't know how many centuries. And it says in this book that Siegfried was, quote, Nepos et Cognitus Germanus, which being translated means, Nepos means grandson, et means and, Cognitus means relative by blood on his mother's side, Germanus means offspring. Then it says, you know, in, in this writing, that this old ancient writing said he was the offspring, Germanus, to the king of Denmark. And he is said to have come to claim his hereditary rights. So it was said that Siegfried, this is the way it would read, was the grandson and relative by blood on his mother's side and offspring to the king of Denmark. And I believe that the term great-grandson was probably not used when all this was written down. Siegfried's mother was Reginhild de Friesland, who was the daughter of Gottfried, Duke of Frisia. He was given this, uh, these lands, you know, by some emperors, by some rulers to kind of keep the tension and keep all the, these wars and, and battles from taking place. So Godfrey was given this and he was given the title Duke of Frisia. And Reginhild de Friesland was also the granddaughter, and here we go, talking about him as far as Siegfried being the, uh, uh, the, the grandson the offspring of the king of Denmark, 
Reginald Hill, his mother, was the granddaughter of King Harold Clack Hathdanison. And he was king in Hathabai, Denmark. This shows where Siegfried was from on his mother's side, being an offspring to the king of Denmark, which was Harold Clack, half Danistan. We're going to talk in our next video about uh, the Douglas family and their connection with the Viking and the Saxons, these leaders and kings and uh, uh, leaders of, uh, uh, in, in, in these areas come from a very powerful clan. No, no wonder, you know, the Douglases helped out with uh, the, the Scottish uh, or Scotland's independence. And we see how Robert the Bruce and William the Wallace and how even the Douglases was even connected with royalty then wanting to help them out. And I see where that it comes from. You know, some always say, well, it's in the genes. And it's not talking about you know, some name brand pair of pants that you may be wearing is talking about the bloodline, it being in our bloodline. So, said that he was even come, you know, to claim his hereditary rights. Uh, rights. And, and even in, in these, the, these ancient writings, it said that, that Siegfried was from the bloodline of Walbert, W-A-L-B-E-R-T. There was a Count Walbert that gave his land to St. Burton in Gwens in 663. I don't know, this was 200 or more years before Siegfried ever got there, but I don't believe that this is the one that we're talking about. So how could this be that Walbert, that Siegfried is coming uh, to Gwens to claim the, said the paternal, the father's inheritance? But get this, on his paternal side, his father's side, who was Theodric, Siegfried's uh, father's grandfather. So it might be his great-grandfather was named Walbert. So could that be some link to where somebody, you know, sees these names and they're trying to put them all together, you know, just like we are today? So, you know, this is what I see. You know, he came as far as from the bloodline, the maternal side, you know, from the king of Denmark through the Vikings. He come, come to claim his paternal inheritance. So I've never had placed in the sea where, uh, where, where Theodric, uh, Siegfried's uh, father, where his grandfather you know, and possibly there, there might be a record there where he came into France because there was always all this movement, all these coming in and, and seizing these lands and claiming them or being given these lands, you know, by, by, by emperors and, and rulers and, and, and these, these dukes, you know, to kind of hold on, you know, and, and have as an inheritance. So, you know, this possibly could be. So this is what, you know, the writer, I believe, was really talking about. So during the time that Siegfried invaded and what they said seized Gwens, Arnulf the Great, who was the Count of Flanders, son of Baldwin II, came to terms and became friends with Siegfried, who they would, like I said, uh, nickname the Dane. You know, they thought he, he was just a full-blooded Viking, but he came from, from a Viking and, and Saxon descent. So it says, you know, in, in, in Lambert's, uh, what, what Lambert said about him, that Siegfried was even attracted to Etherud, who was the daughter of Arnulf. He fell in love with this young lady who was the daughter of Arnulf, the first, the third count of Flanders. Said it was even said that he stole her away and during the time she became pregnant. And they had a son named Ardulf de Gwines, the second count of Gwens, who was born about 930. And they had a daughter, and a lot of researchers says, Highwise de Gwens. You remember what I said? I don't believe it's Halloways de Gwens. I believe it may have could have been Highways de Gwens where they're getting, you know, confused about it. So now near the end of this video, and I know it's been a little lengthy than the others, I want to show you how that this certain 
family trees even line up with Charlemagne and Alfred the Great, you know, who was king in England. So at the top of the list, I see Emperor Charlemagne. Then the next in, in this bloodline is Emperor Louis I. Then Charles II, King of France. Then he would have a daughter named Judith, daughter of Charles II. She would marry Baldwin I, first Count of Flanders. Then he, his son, was Baldwin II, second, second Count of Flanders. He married Ethereth of Wessex, daughter of King Alfred. They would have a son named Arna the I, the third Count of Flanders. And, she, and he would marry Adela of Vermadar. And that's where Siegfried married their daughter, Ethrude de Flanders. Siegfried of Gwens, the first Count of Gwens, died in 965 in Gwens, Nord, Pas de Calais, France. The next video, like I said, we're going to talk about is the Douglas family Viking Saxon connection. And just to sort of throw this in, my DNA, there is a big percentage that even goes in as far to the what they call the, the northwestern part of Europe. And in, in, in my ancestry, and, and when you see the map of, of my, my bloodline, it goes right in to the corner of that northern part of France that they call even the county of Flanders, the same area where Gwens is. So that map of my bloodline goes right into that. Also in my bloodline, uh, have had uh, certain percentages, and it's just a small percentage that shows up Denmark and Sweden and Finland. So I believe that there you show as far as the Viking. And it also shows up as far as in my DNA, also the bloodline of just a, it's just a small amount. It, it shows as far as uh, uh, the Germanic tribe, and that I could go on into Lower Saxony. So I believe my paper trail and even the Y-DNA test, you know, that, that took my male bloodline back to Queensbury, Drumland Rig, Scotland. I believe the DNA takes it on even back further into these families to show that what I believe that my paper trail, I believe, is right. Uh, you know, and I, I believe I'm on the right, I just say this, but I believe, I believe I'm on the right trail. You know, I don't, I don't want to look, you know, sound haughty and, and prideful, but I believe I'm on the right trail according to my paper trail and, and my research. And I know this might be, you might well say, is just one you know, man's opinion. But you know, I, I hope you know, that this has helped. You know, and, and you could you could go as far as to my, my website. And like I said, all you have to do is just Google dark stream. Dark stream at wixsite.com. That's W-I-X. C-I-T-E dot com. I mean, just, just Google it and possibly you can come up and you can you can see, you know, my website and I got all this information in about even the La Fleming family, the Vikings and on in further even to the Douglas family all the way back as far as even, you know, in, into Georgia right here where, where I'm coming to you today from. So I hope this has helped. So if you could, you know, give us a thumbs up, you know, make, make a comment and I, I, maybe I can be able to, uh, respond as far as to your comment. My comments are open. Uh, if you got any questions, you can also even email me at Silas Douglas. That's S I L A S D O U G L A S 4058 at yahoo.com. And maybe, you know, if, if, I've, if I've got the answer, you know, I'll be able to answer you back. Maybe I can help you as far as in your family research. Subscribe to this channel and it will help us out. Thank you. Like I said, our next video, we're going to go on into some more exciting stories uh, about the Douglas family and the Viking Saxon connection. Thank you for listening today.